Okay, well, good afternoon. My name is Charlie or Charlotte Burnell and I'm a master student at UCL and I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about Middle Stone Age problem solving. Um, so first of all, what is problem solving? It's the process of finding solutions to difficult or complex problems. Um, just as a bit of an example, I'm not sure who here is familiar with this brain puzzle of the farmer who has a boat, he has a chicken, a fox and a grain and he has to get to the other side. But you can only take one object at a time. If he leaves the chicken with the fox, the fox will eat the chicken. If he leaves the chicken with the grain, the chicken will eat the grain. How do we all four get across? Um, if you need the answer, you can ask me at the end. But basically, <laughs> It's a nice illustration of problem solving. But the truth is, is that we are constantly problem solving in our brains. There are lots of different types. There's big problems, there's little problems such as, you know, do I get coffee, do I get tea, what time's the train, or, you know, what am I doing with my life? Um, so, when we talk about problem solving, we can study it in two ways, either as an individual or as a collective. Now, collective problem solving can also, we sort of sometimes call it social learning. Um, and this study done by Kemp and Masudi in 2014 basically showed, very obviously, that having more cultural parents or having um, more information coming to you means that you are going to learn faster. Who knew? Um, but basically, it's, it's this really exciting idea that you learn from other people. Um, also, a vital aspect of problem solving on an individual capacity is something that is going to be the basis of this talk, which is working memory. Now, working memory is a psychological term that describes the part of short-term memory which is concerned with the immediate conscious, linguistic and perceptual processing. Or in short, it's how our brains actually solve these problems. You perceive a need, the associated problems, and then you conceptualize a solution. The individual sets aside this immediate issue, and then there's a series of physical actions with appropriate objects to solve the problem and, importantly, satisfy the need. So if you think about back to the illustration of the farmer, he, his problem is, is the boat, his solution is, you know, getting all the other things across, and then the need is he gets to go to his farm. Um, yes, and this is, this is basically what working memory is. Now the question is, is how do we study this in the archaeological record? Now in 2010, Miriam Hadel published uh, an article called Working Memory and the Evolution of Modern Cognitive Potential, in which she created something called a conigram, which is basically a chain operatoire with cognition. And the example that you can see on the, on the board here is the use of a stone tool by an otter to open shells. It's got four phases. The first is the otter's hungry. That's your need. Perception of the first sub-problem is how to access the shells, which means that you need a tool. So it then goes down, it picks up a stone tool, gets its clam, smashes the two together, and you satisfy the need, which is, of course, hunger, because you get to eat the food. Now, I'm not going to go into what's going on to the next slide too much, but just as a comparison, this is an otter eating. This is the production and use of a spear by Haida Bugalensis. And now what you can see here is there are 29 phases within this sequence. And what that shows us is an absolute greater complexity in not only, um, obviously, what this, this, um, Oh, English, Homo is doing, but also that the actual cognitive process is much more complex because you have many more sub-problems and usually you'd have to come back to them. So what a conogram can do is show the stages and phases of the working memory process. And this basically brings us to this very simple thought, which is that an artifact can be shown as complex cognitive behaviour, which shows this working memory process. Conograms are effectively your chain operatoire plus cognition, and it lets us ask this very important question, which is, what problem caused the people at that time to make this artifact? We can start to see artifacts in a slightly new way. Now, in Paleolithic research, which is my field of study, there are a couple of very key questions. 
for example, when does certain technology develop? Who developed it and what does this tell us about human evolution? Now projectile weaponry is one of those major innovations that occurs. Now after 40,000 years, it's sort of widespread and predominant in the archaeological record. But before then, it's a little bit like, oh, have we actually got this going on? So the time period that borders the Middle Paleolithic and the Late Paleolithic, or Middle Stone Age and Late Stone Age, is sort of wrapped up in this origins of modernity debate and is quite an important area to look at where and how projectile technology developed. Now the Middle Stone Age ranges from about 250,000 to 40,000 years ago and has a quite a good range of sites. Um, I'm sort of focusing on uh, southern Africa and what we see within the Middle Stone Age are these two very sophisticated industries called the Still Bay at 77 to 72,000 years ago and the House in Port at 65 to 59,000 years ago. Now these are described as dynamic periods of change that have social and stylistic elaboration within the Southern <coughs> Middle Stone Age. And they both have lancelet points and half-tip blades and also other sophisticated material cultures such as bone tools, ochre, marine shell beads and a structured use of social space. Some of the key sites that you might have heard of are Blombos, Dykloff, Sibudu, Port River, Port Epic, sorry, and Clazes River. Um, and what we see is that the advanced lithics and the associated materials within these industries is comparable to industries in the Upper Paleolithic some 30,000 years later. Now if we talk about projectile weaponry, what do we mean? There's two classifications of projectiles, simple and complex. Simple are uh, things like handheld spears, throwing sticks and close range weapons. Complex before the invention of firearms are your bows and arrows, your dart blowers, your spear throwers. Um, and in short, simple requires human energy and complex requires a human force and a mechanical element of some description. Now we do have evidence of projectiles within the MSA from use trace analysis, there's hafting, there's residue, that kind of thing. But the argument is whether or not these are simple or complex. Now in 2006, Shea created this box and whisker plot to show whether or not he thought that the values suggested simple or complex. And what we can see here in the corner is that the arrow and dart tips, which are your complex projectiles, um, and the spear points, which is your more simple projectiles, most of the studies that he looked at in this tip cross-sectional analysis suit more towards the simple projectile weapon systems. There was a later study done on the tip parameter section, um, and which also provided similar results. So we're not really sure whether there are complex projectiles, but there are definitely sim simple projectiles within these systems. And because they developed independently in both Africa and Eurasia by two distinct hominins, there has to be something other than the fact that they were made by one species to argue, well, why did this technology come about? So to quickly recap, we have two sophisticated industries with evidence of projectile technology. They appear for only a few thousand years, and we know from what we said about working memory at the start that artifacts can be seen as solutions to problems. So we can ask what's going on during the Middle Stone Age and what could have led to projectiles needing to be developed. In short, what problems were Middle Stone Age people solving? So to answer this, a couple of case sites. Firstly is Blombos Cave, which is quite famous, 300 kilometers east of Cape Town in South Africa. There's six phases of occupation, and the Middle Stone Age dates from between 99 to 73,000 years ago, and it was dated using opt optically stimulated luminescence. Now, the lithics is some of the most extensive and well-documented of the Still Bay, with 15 to 18,000 lithic pieces, most of which were part of the napping process, but we do have some incredible examples. And as you can see on the far, my far left, your right, that um, there is evidence of this uh, discoloration, which is due with hafting. And over here on the left, we have um, evidence of resharpening. 
um, which Manchillo in 2005 said that the pattern of resharping strongly suggests axial hafting. Now, if we look at the faunal assemblage, Blombos is famous for its tortoises, but overall there's a pattern towards very small or small mammals. There's also burning of rodents, which suggests roasting, and that there's this resource intensification due to climatic stress. But basically, in short, that the ecological conditions inland are argued to have suited these species, and that is why you are seeing these species at this site. What this fails to consider is one really important aspect, which is animal behaviour. So, ninja antelope. Basically, there is this size one ungulate, uh, which comes up in the record of Blombos, um, which is a steambok or a greasebok, also known as one of the tiny ten. It's a dwarf antelope. As you can see here, this is a man's hand. That's how tiny their feet are. These are the little creatures that we're talking about hunting. And they live alone or in their mated pair, and they live in thicket, in shrubs. They are very fast, very agile, and extremely difficult to catch. The only way that they're hunted in sort of modern day by their natural predators is that the leopard or the cheetah pretty much projects themselves out, swipes down the creature, and chokes them to death. But humans don't have this projection power or built-in weaponry to catch this very fast, very small creature. Instead, they have to rely on tools. So if we're talking about how this idea of working memory and the evidence that this site shows is that if you want to catch a ninja antelope because you're hungry, you're going to have to use either a net, a snare, um, or some sort of projectile weaponry. Now, most of those things are organic, so we're not going to find them in the archaeological record, but we will have evidence of projectiles. So, as I said at the beginning, need, hunger, problem, ninja antelope, sub-problem, a weapon to catch this prey, and the solution is one of these technologies. And therefore, the combination of the faunal assemblage with the lithic and also understanding of animal behaviour, we can see a technological response to change. Now, if we look at our next site at Sabudu Cave, it's 40 kilometres north of Durban in South Africa, and there are five phases of occupation. Now, the, because we talked about the Steel Bay at Blombos, I'm going to focus on the Howison's Port, which is between 65 and 62 and a half thousand years ago. Now, the lithics, again, are very quite interesting. The argument here by Wadley and Mahapi, who did the analysis on it, is that actually they their TCSA values show more towards complex. They said that the courts are more like North American arrowheads, the horn fells like darts, and give or take that the dolerites are more like your experimental spearheads. So they're arguing that the possibly within this period there are complex projectiles. But even if you disagree with that, there is strong evidence that there is at least simple projectile systems. So again, why are we seeing this? What problem could be there in order to catch it? Now, very similar to Blombos, we see a preference towards smaller game, but there's also a very interesting discovery at Sabudu, which is the use of bird exploitation. And a study done by Val in 2016 showed burning, cutting, and disarticulation of the wings, which shows direct evidence of human exploitation of birds um, you know, 77,000 years ago, which is way before the Upper Paleolithic. Other small mammals at the site, such as hares, hyrexes, Gambian rats, are also being found. And this shows that they are successfully hunting small, fast prey, which, as I said earlier, means that they're going to have to use one of these technologies. And it cannot be a coincidence that the appearance of projectile-like lithics appear in association with animals that require a faster way of catching them. So to recap, we're starting to see a pattern of smaller and faster game and a wider range of animal species being hunted. The lithics point to simple and possibly complex projectile systems, and this is sort of happening across a lot of Middle Stone Age sites. So what about the broader picture? Well, the Middle Stone Age paleoenvironment evidence says that prior to the emergence of these two industries, there was a deep sort of bottlenecking or aridity of human populations that condense them round water sources. 
And one of the other things that I said earlier was about multiple cultural parents and the fact that this speeds up the learning process. It could be that when we have this bottleneck, um, the ability to create more complex technologies such as projectiles is further enhanced and that when the aridity declines and human populations spread out, this technology is lost because it's either no longer needed or you don't have the cultural parents to do that. I think further research will probably show us. So in short, and to summarise, we have two industries that still bear in the house and port with these projectiles. The two sites that we've looked at show the shift towards smaller game, and as we can see from understanding working memory, we can view artefacts as solutions to problems. Overall, this is showing an adaptation to changing environments and the plasticity of hominins. By appreciating animal behavior, we can understand subsistence strategies. By understanding psychology, we can see cognitive processes and innovation in artifacts as solutions and complex problems. The concept of working memory provides us with a new angle to the origins of projectile technology debate because it refocuses research onto human and animal behavior whilst encompassing traditional lines of archeological evidence. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.